Hi, everybody. I'm Clay Smith. I'm the literary director of the San Antonio Book Festival. I am not Georgia Irk, uh, in case there's any uh, misperception. I am not Georgia. Um, Georgia is having some um, web camera problems. And one thing that you have to have in the age of online book festivals is a web camera. So she has one. We just don't know what has happened to it. So it's appropriate this is happening at a kind of a comedic novel um, panel. If this was like Philip Roth, it'd be another thing entirely. So um, anyway, um, we are here with um, Amanda Air Ward, whose latest novel is titled The Jet Setters. Um, I think it'll be out in paperback soon. And um, Grant Ginder, whose latest book is titled The People We Hate at the Wedding. So um, some great book titles there. So let me tell you a little bit about both of them. Um, Georgia was able to uh, send her questions right over to me, so I will try to do um, the best I can. This is uh, when it helps to be a really old book journalist who's moderated a ton of events before, so just hang tight, everybody. Um, Amanda is the author of eight previous books. Um, her best-selling novels have been featured in People magazine and the New York Times. Her work has been optioned for film and television and translated into 15 languages. In fact, I think um, adaptation is something that has luckily happened for the both of you, so maybe that's something that we could talk about. She lives in Austin and Uray, Colorado. She currently writes every morning and spends afternoons with her children. And let's see, Grant was born in Laguna Beach, California. He attended the University of Pennsylvania and got his MFA from NYU, uh, where he currently teaches. His writing has appeared in Lit Hub, the Harvard advocate, Fail Better, which is a new one on me, Bodega, <laughs> and Seven by Seven. Uh, he lives in Brooklyn. So um, welcome to Grant and Amanda. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we're going to um, just sort of fly by night with this. Um, so just a reminder to everybody, uh, we um, have chosen Nowhere Bookshop a new indie bookstore in San Antonio as our bookstore. Um, books, indie bookstores have had a hard time during the pandemic, so we hope you will uh, consider clicking on the Buy the Books button. Um, that takes you directly to Nowhere Bookshop and to Grant's um, and Amanda's um, pages on their site. Very easy to buy their books, either for curbside shipping or um, curbside pickup uh, or shipping. And there it is right there. That setters is in paperback, and I guess that means that Clay has not been following me on social media because I've posted uh, about it way more than anyone would want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll you privately about that, Clay. Yeah, and we can talk privately about that. Um, <laughs> and then also a note to place your questions in the Q&A box, uh, and we will try to get to as many of those as we can. So let's see what... Georgia slash Clay wants to ask. Um, so, okay, I do not know this. Um, Amanda, you told me you have some breaking news about the jet setters. You might be able to tell us today. Is that still the case? Yes, still not. I don't know what the deal is about saying it officially, but let's go. Um, it's going to be a television show on ABC. It's been optioned by Mandible Productions and bought by ABC. And um, Sam Greisman, who's Sally Field's son, is writing the pilot. And I love him, and I love the whole team, and it's a dream come true. And hopefully I'll get to write on the show um, which, as I was telling Grant, they really didn't want me to do because I don't know how to write television, but I just have this vision of myself in Los Angeles um, or maybe Malibu Beach, where Grant is from. But I just want to try. It's going to be exciting. I love um, the incredible television shows coming out now. Um, since I have a family, I watch a lot of great comedy, smart comedy. Um, and speaking of Shit's Creek, I hear Grant has some news, too. <laughs> yeah, so so um, so people who hated the wedding. I guess I should hold up mine too. This is the hard cover, but it's out in paperback too. Um, is uh, in development as well um, at Film Nation, which is um, a production company that did um, The Big Sick, Arrival, Promising Young Woman, and as of right now, um, Alice and Janney, 
Annie Murphy from um, Schitt's Creek and Ben Platt are um, are attached to to star in it, which is really exciting. So keeping my keeping everything that I can anatomically cross crossed uh, <laughs> at that age, uh, that it hits theaters. But I was or, telling or, you, or, or we're streaming yeah. services wherever yes. people are watching things these days. I was telling Grant, our work is so similar, and I love his character so much that it should be the same project. Like, our books should both, there could be a wedding and then a cruise, and you know, the same mother. Well, we, could do like a, we could do like a, you know, like a law and order crossover episode where, like, the families meet and, like, you know, you know, shenanigans ensue. I love that idea. I think a wedding on a cruise would be pretty great. I mean. Yes. Yes. You know, so my two characters, um, Cord, Clay, I mean Cord, <laughs> I based my main character, Cord, on a combination of me and Clay Smith. And he has a young um, fiance, Giovanni, and I would love to see them get married. So maybe they can get married near your wedding. Maybe a double wedding. <laughs> yeah, they just, they, just, they just come through the south of England where, where the wedding takes place in this book. Sure. <laughs> I don't think they can disembark in the age of COVID. <laughs> um, so we've titled this one, Get Me Out of Here, a fiction on family stuck in vacation. What do both of your families think about the sort of premise of your novels? <laughs> because it's sort of saying like, I'm sick of my family. <laughs> um, I, I had to do quite a bit of um like quite a bit of like preemptive damage control um with my own family to convince them and it really is not based on my family um mm -hmm. it um it is it's based on like actually the wedding of an almost complete stranger that i went to actually in the south uh southwest of england um but i had to do a lot of preemptive damage control um to convince them that that it isn't about them, particularly my mother. Um, the, the mother plays like quite a big character in this book. Um, though I'd like to think that the mother in this book is like sort of the hero. Um, I also had to do quite a bit of pre preemptive damage control on um, regarding, there's a character in the book who is, um, one, one of the siblings in the, in the book is a gay man and he has a partner who is not the most supportive. I mean, it's kind of abusive and emotionally manipulative. And that character, the, the kind of the asshole, his name's Mark, and my husband's name is Mac. And I didn't realize that there was only one letter separating their names until it was in like copy edits. And my editor pointed out to me like, oh, did Mac think that this character is based on him? Um, <laughs> so that took, that took a little bit of like, you know, damage control as well. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it's funny when I, it, one of the biggest questions that I get asked when I'm teaching is, what do you do about your family, if it's a real story, or the friend that you're writing about? And and I always say, to, I think it's something I worried about too when I was very early on in my writing career. And you really, I tell my students, you know, you write whatever you want. You write about your mother, you can use your husband's name with one letter change. You can do, I name a lot of characters after ex-boyfriends who've wronged me. And I just lay it all out there. And then the, the idea is you get an agent with the best thing you possibly can. You get an editor with the best thing you possibly can. And at that point, before anyone really sees it in your family, you can say, how important is it that the mother is like this? Or would, like right now, actually, in the book that I'm finalizing, um, I'm working on the last draft of, there's a character that is sort of an uncomfortably close character to someone I know, and so I made them blonde. <laughs> so they'll never know. No, but I'm, I'm going through now, and, and with my editor saying, what if this is vital, and what if this can be changed? And that said, the character of Charlotte in The Jet Setters um, lives in my mother's condo. She drives my mother's golf cart and drinks barefoot Chardonnay like my mother. And I sent it to my mother. I sent the draft, the first draft, to a Kinko's in Savannah and had it delivered to her house. And she read it and called me and said, people are going to think that Charlotte is me. And I said, yes. And she said, 
I said, do you need me to change things? Is this upsetting? And she said, oh, no, but should I write the Times and tell them that it's me? And she wants to play Charlotte in the movie. So sort of illustrating how much she's like Charlotte. <laughs> she loves it. So I'm really lucky. My family's very supportive. And my husband's a geologist and doesn't often read what I write, which is kind of great. <laughs> yeah, I've been pretty lucky too in terms of my family being being very supportive. Um, they, I, there was also, I mean, Amanda, just what you were saying about like writing, writing what you want to write, and I'm not particularly caring, or not particularly allowing it to to sort of weigh on you the implications that you might be using material from your real life or people you really know. I think it was Lori Moore who said something along the lines of like, write the thing you don't want your mother to read. Um, which in, in my case is often, you know, characters that are somewhat based on my mother. Um, but, but yeah, you can't, I feel like you can't allow that stuff to encroach in on, you know, at least as you were saying, the first few drafts of something. Um, Cause you have to like pull from your life, right? Writers are vampires. We you write what you write. I don't even know sometimes what's real and what's not real. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes my sisters will say that did actually happen, but then this other thing happened in your book, and um, you just kind of pull from. I'm reading this story about hearing voices. I don't know if either of you have seen this. It was just on long reads last night at some article, and it's about how there's a movement to look into people who they formerly thought were schizophrenic and and look into the brains of other people who hear voices and one of the groups they're studying are novelists. Because where do these stories come from? Hmm. It's fascinating. I haven't gotten to the end, so I don't know, Grant, if we're gonna be locked up or. <laughs> where is I mean, they should probably lock us up for a number of reasons. <laughs> but then, yeah, and I'd be away from my kids in a cell. Mm, books to read. That would be terrible. So let's talk about uh, family secrets. Family secrets are uh, pretty crucial to both of these novels. Um, I guess, you know, we're in that danger position where like the books have been out, but we don't know how much to reveal. And, you know, I, I, I know the family secrets, but I guess to the extent that you're comfortable without giving too much away, um, how, how did you come up with the family secrets in the novel, because in both cases, they seem to propel a lot of good action, a lot of good plot for you all. Grant, go ahead. I mean, obviously, Amanda, I mean, in yours, like, there's um, Cord being, so there's three children in your novel, and the mother, who you just talked about, takes them on a cruise. This is not giving anything away. Takes them on a cruise uh, because she won a contest um, that reveals something kind of uh, saucy about her earlier, about her youth, let's say. Yeah. So there are numerous family secrets in that novel. Um, one of them is Cord being closeted, but uh, there, are, there are other ones too, right? Yeah, I mean, I'll say two things. One is that every other novel I've written has had a clear mystery, like a crime to be solved, um, or a, in the same sky, it was a child going from Honduras to the United States, a journey. And this was so hard, just having the characters be it, um, that I, in the book I'm working on now, there's a body, because it's so much easier for me to have that driving the plot. Although I, I love reading these books, like Grant's, that delve into character and the characters themselves are propelling the narrative along. But I thought, oh, the cruise goes to 10 cities, things happen that are hilarious in each place and it'll be great. And so they end up in, you know, I went on the cruise, I took notes, I had these characters, I let them move through the things and I handed it in and my editor just said, I don't care. And I thought, Oh no, this is a real problem. And, and, and it's very, very hard to do these books where the characters are all you, you know, their forward movement is not based on solving anything or finding anything. Um, so I really had to go deeply into the characters to figure out what often they were hiding. I think the secrets for me propelled the narrative in the way that the secret of what happened to a dead body in an in another kind of novel would propel the narrative. So in any case, 
it's really, 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 really hard for me as it turns out. Um, but so I so admire the books that do it well and love them. And that's what I'm always looking for. And then the second thing I just wanted to touch on, which is something that I was lucky, Clay, that you helped me with was figuring out why this character would be closeted in this day and age from his mother. And that's his one of his, well, he has a problem with drinking. And one of the reasons he's drinking is that he has to be holiday cord and pretend he's straight or just not talk about who he really is. And it just was like, why on earth now would that be the case? And so I, I had to make his mother extremely religious. That's the way I chose to do it. And then not only Catholic, but I quoted the Pope on homosexuality and I went through that, okay, she's lonely and this priest is her only connection. And I had to have so much at stake for her. And of course she knows he's gay, but her accepting that had to change her life. Um, but that was a tough one because it's a secret that was like, why is that a secret? Hi. Hi, yeah. Georgia. Georgia. <laughs> there she what is. Secrets, your can great you question. Uh, can you hear, how, why can't they hear me? We can hear you. So Grant, can you talk about your secrets in your narrative? Yeah, yeah. Now so family, I secrets, family secrets is something that I, I was funny. I, I'm working on a project right now that there's a huge secret in it as well. I, I think I've always been very interested mm -hmm. in you know, the that? dynamics of a family, the different yes. experiences, the different way that you know four or five people within a family can experience yeah, a secret. Should be able and how um, how secrets and the things that are held from one another or withheld from one another can entirely alter the experience of that event. Um, and Amanda, to your point, it, you know when you're dealing with something, when you're dealing with a, with a, with a novel that's entirely character driven and it's just about um, a, a, a a characters sort of these characters experiencing just kind of the world around them and each other you do need something to propel the story and so oh uh, i wish i had talked to you two years ago <laughs> and so the secret does sort of serve that for people we hate at the wedding i mean the thing that propels the story in, in, in my mind isn't necessarily the secret so much as it is the this family is going to a wedding right and so you have kind of the book has an ending right the book has sort of a a movement towards something so for me that that that's what's propelling it the secret for me um is is more of just sort of a fascination family secrets are more of a fascination not only like like secrets that we look at as um, as malicious or things that should you know should be out in the open but also i think what really interests me and this is this is the case in, in, in the people we hate at the wedding, the secret is kept or a lie is told, in fact, to protect someone. And so like, wh where is that point when, when telling the truth becomes maybe even a little bit selfish as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, lying or keeping a secret to protect someone you love? Like that interplay to me, it is um is fascinating because I think that that's kind of the internal bargain that we're all making with ourselves every single day with the people we love. Is how I'm literally notes on this because that is so smart. <laughs> I, I I you know it's one of those things that I didn't realize that I didn't realize that I was so fascinated with it until I wrote four books about it, and then like after the fourth one, I was like, wait, maybe I'm kind of obsessed with this idea. Um, yeah, so that's, internal bargain. that is the I think the role that secrets play. Hey, let me just um, intercede here, uh, Georgia. Can you can you talk, and we can make sure that we can hear you. I can talk. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. You can. So, I can't believe it. I just drove a hundred miles an hour to Josie Seligson's house and got on her computer where her dog was logged in and I couldn't get on. But now I'm on and what shake and bacon is off. So, well, I hope that what shake and bacon enjoyed this panel. Um, I enjoyed he, it. He's, so, he's well known you. on the internet. Uh, yes. And we're lucky okay. to have him here. Bye. Okay. So, Thanks so much, Clay. So you've already, inter you've already been introduced by Clay, right? And does everyone know that Grant teaches at NYU now. Did he cover all that? 
Yeah. Okay. And then, um, did Amanda, hi, Amanda. Um, hi. Did you talk about your breaking news that you have today? I did. I first in the, I did. I did. You did talk about it already? Well, yes. A lot. What about your movie deal, Clay? I mean, we Grant. talked about that too. You did, and Alice and Janney? <laughs> we talked, we did, talked, about, we talked about Alice and Janney. We did, we did. Okay, Thanks and for and really good questions. Okay, um, did you talk about comparing the two books and, and how they're completely different families living in two completely different stories, and yet, you have all these similar themes and family dynamics and family dysfunction going on, which shows that like most families are basically the same. You know, we, we all have the same basic wants, needs, desires. We all want to be loved. We all want to be seen. We all want to be known for who we truly are. Did y'all talk about that too? Not as elegantly as you just did. Oh. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Well, I did want to talk about, uh, talk about that because even though these are funny books, they're also, they're like deep funny, you know, because they're funny, but they have this underlying sadness and you're dealing with issues that most families, most real families don't want to talk about. So I admire you for being, fr being brave, even though it's fiction, because this is what gives the reader empathy. And there's a teacher in San Antonio, Colleen Grissom, who says people don't have empathy now because people don't read books anymore. Um, but you're doing a good job of putting us in someone else's shoes and making us feel empathy. And I thought that your both books were similar to David Sedaris's story in The New Yorker. Now we're five about his sister Tiffany's suicide um, because it's about the people left behind, you know, and how much that affects families. Grant, yours has a father dying and, you know, there's a secret, which y'all were talking about. And so the siblings are left not knowing why why the mother has moved on so quickly. And with Amanda, you have the suicide and the people left behind are almost destroyed by it, you know, and by the secret. Can y'all talk about the people left behind in both your stories and how that death affects them? Well, I can say one thing quickly, um, that, and this returns to what we were talking about in terms of the engines of the plot. It was late in the game that I decided that only one character would know the truth about the father's death. And part of that was to help fix this problem of the novel not having enough at stake. So when I realized, oh, what if only one child and the mother knew the truth of this situation? How would that affect that one child? And Lee originally was not even one of the more important characters in the book. But as it went on, and then I asked the prologue from her point of view, I realized she's the one that was holding this truth. So I guess I do know about <laughs> withholding truth in a way. And, and what it costs you to pretend that a lie is true or to just not speak the truth. And for her, I think it costs her her mental health and her sanity, really. Right. And it costs her her relationship to her siblings. Yeah, you know, and so because they thought she just ditched them and she didn't. Right. What about you, Grant? Yeah, I the people left behind. It's a, it's a now I want to like call. I want to have a book called The People Left Behind. Um, that's yes. a good. <laughs> um, I I guess there's also already the leftovers, but um, I um again kind of going. I I, I was Georgia right before you signed in. I was talking about. I'm, I'm really fascinated about just the. Um, the wholly different experiences that four very close family members can have of a specific event or memory or recollection or whatever, right? The, the filters right. that goes through, um, any event goes through um, via, you know, our own anxieties, our own insecurities, the lies that we tell ourselves, the things we want to believe. And so, um, and so for me, the, 
the death of the father kind of allowed me to play with that, right? You had one character who, the, the son who kind of idolized, who or not kind of, but did idolize the father, even though when the father died, he in fact did not approve the son was gay. But the son doesn't know that, the, the mother is, a, you know, keeping that secret from the son um, uh, to protect the son, which in, it, the mother kind of falls on her own sword, right? She has to keep this secret and in turn, the son is angry at her um, for, for actions that she takes. Um, so, so again, I think it allowed me to, to kind of play with that notion of how, how four people, five people in this case, can, um, can so wholly differently experience one event, right? Or how memory can, can be so wholly different of a single person. I also just sort of like, didn't want to juggle that many people, if I'm being totally honest. Um, like it was much easier <laughs> to have a single mom um, or like a widower, right? And it, I think it also makes Donna, the mother, uh, it, it, it gives her some pain, it gives her some complication mm -hmm. uh, and something to explore. And so, I don't know, I'm like always killing parents off. Yeah, in the book, there's like the, the 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 dad's long gone too. Like it's you know it's just right. uh, I you I think you from a logistical point you get you get to this this place where you're like oh I'm so tired of juggling so many people. Let's kill one of them off. Yeah, <laughs> don't you think it's more though than juggling different people's memories? I think most of it is well, a lot of it's about truth, and that's mm -hmm. such a big theme because people in both books are avoiding the truth and it's destroying their mental health and their relationships. And, mm -hmm. and when they're at their lowest point, like um, when Lee is at her low point, she says, it feels so good to tell the truth, mm -hmm. you know? Even though she's revealing that she's not a successful actress anymore and her life is in shambles, she says, it feels so good to tell the truth. And also your character, Grant Paul, is saying um, when Mark breaks up with him, he says, you can't tell me what to do anymore. You know, it's like this victory. He has himself back, you know. Mm -hmm. There are so many different themes, the way that you kept wrapping them all together, both of you. Like, you know, how um, Winston was able to tear the siblings down just by his words and his own insecurities and you know he's able to tear them down and mark is able to tear paul down when paul always supported mark so that's another theme like the importance of a supportive lover or the importance of family members to you know have your back and and the family members are complaining you know, and saying um, everyone's basically more messed up than I am. But when it comes right down to it, in Amanda's book, Reagan says, you know, toxic family or not, you get what you get. And when when all those characters who they don't like, you know, when they get to their lowest, the siblings jump in to save them, which I think is a really nice thing. Thank yeah, you. I'm good, right? Am I talking I too much? No, no, not at all. I just, um, I just think there's so many, so many things that you touched on for these funny books, and it's hard to to spin these things in a way where you're entertaining the reader, but then they're thinking about these difficult issues long after they stop laughing. You know. It seems like comedy has a lot to do with tragic events or difficult situations. Yeah. Yeah, I like life is funny. Like it just like is, you know, it just is. Like there like among all of the tragedy, among all of the terrible shit that, you know, particularly these past 14 months that we've seen, like life, oh my god. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh my gosh. So sweet. Look at that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, so let's talk about addiction. 
addiction is something in both books. Talk about um, Alice's addiction to clonopin. Yeah, so there's a character in the book, a, a sibling in the book, who's kind, who's like a, a total mess. Um, <laughs> Uh, who, who is, in fact, my favorite character, right, because she is such a mess, who, uh, who's had, like, like kind of a tough time. Uh, there was an event that happened in her life that she is clearly still hanging on to, and it's, it, it's affecting her mental health. And she has gotten herself, she's also in an affair with her boss, uh, who's married, <laughs> uh, kind of like in a debt end, uh, that she doesn't really care about, um, and she's $20,000 in debt. And she's also a dick with one of them, um, which is a, a, a type of benzodiazepine. It's like, you know, it's, it, it's a, people know what is. Um, it, it's an anti-anxiety drug. Um, and she snorts it. Um, and that actually was a, a really last minute addition to the book. Um, and, you know, as I was writing it in a, in a subsequent, a subsequent draft, as I was revising, I was like, I had, a, I had a, a rule for myself, this is gonna make me sound like a terrible person, um, but I had a rule for myself <laughs> as I was writing this book, which was, I had a post-it, <laughs> this is really gonna make me sound like a terrible person, um, I had a post-it note on the computer screen that, that said, kick them while they're down, um, <laughs> which was, I, I, was, I always wanted, I, I, I'm, I was interested in these people's self-destruction um, and the ways in which they self-destruct. And so, for Alice, uh, as I was working through it, I was like, you know what? She needs one more thing. Let's hook her to Clonopin. Um, and so, um, so that's I, I um, that's kind of how that worked out. Um, which, when you read her, makes sense. Um, she's right. she's a character that is avoiding. She kind of just barrels forward through life and is avoiding kind of any sense of responsibility. Um, and so, so for me, of all the characters, that was the one to make the most sense. And she's kind of one of, well, all of the characters think everyone else is a total mess yes. until that one point where they're like, oh, maybe it's me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was I, the and, other. And Amanda, that your other characters do that too. You know, everyone thinks that the youngest Reagan in your book just because she is fat or chubby and not as attractive as Lee, and she's not a movie star, she's she's a mother. Everyone thinks she's just a pushover because she has this really shitty husband. But then you find out, no, Reagan is the most grounded one, you know, and she's she's happy with herself, and her mother is says, you know, she's um, kind of embarrassed by Reagan's appearance. But then in another part in the book, she says, really, it's it's her own insecurities because Reagan has seen her when she was at her lowest, you know, when the mother was at her lowest. And, yes. and Reagan has seen her mother through all the fights of the father. And will you talk about the scene with the cheese and crackers? Because Reagan <laughs> is really a fixer. Will you tell what she does during the fights? I mean, really, all the scenes have cheese and crackers. Um, no, just kidding. Yes, that's a great, you know, really all, and including the addictions, it all comes down to this ability or inability to live in truth and in authenticity. You know, I mean, for me, I am sober, and a lot of my journey to not numbing the edges was changing what I needed to change and deciding to just you know, face and accept truths. And one way you can get away with not facing those truths is having some wine and some cheese and crackers every night. Um, one of my friends said, when you can't leave, but you want to leave, <laughs> if you have a few drinks, you can leave in your brain. And so I think it's very interesting to show how living inauthentically really was what brought all these characters down. And for Reagan, her she's just trying to fix everybody all the time. I mean, I am a huge codependent, and I tell my friends this book, The Jet Setters, is about codependence on a cruise ship. And so Reagan, um, which it is, and Reagan, for, and a cruise ship, by the way, is the uh, ultimate example of 
a sort of weird, surreal world, you know, because you're pretending you might not sink. You're pretending there's not salmon out on the food. You're pretending you're actually friends with these people, you know. I mean, it's like a suspended unreality, what's the word? You're like totally disassociated, floating around on this thing, and it's wonderful, <laughs> and I love it. And one of the ways I've dated sober is smiling in that way, because I can be like, just pretend that life is easy breezy. Anyway, um, to your question, so Reagan, even as a little kid, would, when her parents were fighting in a horrible, really abusive way, and and straining to fall apart, she would rush into the kitchen and make cheese and crackers and bring them to her parents and say, hey, everyone, you know, trying to fix the situation. And later she did it for her mother when her mother came home from work and then even does it, you know, as an adult. And so Lee remembers her in that way. Um, even now that they're grown and have and she has a family of her own, she sees her as that little kid who, without knowing what else to do, We'll go make a plate of cheese and crackers, hoping she can fix this situation, which is unfixable and not her job to yeah. fix. And her mother, her mother loves her so much and is trying so hard to be a good person. But yeah. the mother had a horrible mother who would only see her during bath time one hour a day. And she would just say, it is what it is. You know, what would she say? And furthermore, that meant stop talking and about actually it. I have a Southern grandmother um, who that was what she would say all the time. You know, she would say, well, we're not going to go over to that person's house and furthermore. <laughs> and we all, furthermore is like, and even my mom and I will say that, you know, and for, and I say it, my kids, no, you're not going to that party and furthermore. <laughs> yes. But, but Charlotte time. goes, she goes through all that with her mother. And her mother always said, what a disappointment to her. And then when she sees Cord on the ship, she kind of says to or at the Colosseum in Rome, she kind of says to herself, what a disappointment. It just kind of slips out, you know? Right. And, and she's not that kind of person. But I think that's like the fear of every woman is like, oh, shit, I turned into my mother or I'm going to be my mother. Like, I'm really afraid of that. You yeah, know, even even if you have a good mother, and there's you're also the lessons you're given, you know. And I think as you grow into an adult, I mean, that's a, another thing. My book ended up being about surprising me was that when you get together with your family, you revert to who you were as a child, and so you yeah. can have a whole adult, fully realized life. But for example, when I get together with my sisters, we're fighting about the same shit we fought about when we were yes. seven. No, it's the same role. Yeah. I mean, as a small example, my sisters are both very successful, but I'm always like, did you remember to bring this? And like, should I pay for dinner? And they're like, okay, we're in our 30s. So, right. It's okay. Because I'm the older sister. I used to tell my sisters, you can't tell me what to do anymore. I'm married. You know? <laughs> it's like I'm the baby and they still tell me what to do. You know? Well, exactly. I know, and I'm the one who does that. But that's something I hope to keep exploring because I'm kind of at this, you know, I'm personally 48 years old, and I'm kind of done. I'm ready to not be in those roles anymore and, and try to do something new. And that's a pretty great, amazing shift that I want to yeah. explore. Okay, How you so do that? <laughs> another question leading to that is what I ask both of you. Are you the fixer or a fixer of your oh. family or of your friends or anything? Because it seems like all that overthinking of those characters and everything seems like you might be. Uh, uh, that's a good question. I, I, <laughs> in, I, in my friend group, no, I'm not the fixer. Um, I, I just sort of like disassociate. Um, I know there's like a problem. I often cause the problems. Um, and if there are problems, I just like, oh, what's well, happening? Um, um, in my family, that's a really good question. Um, I think there have been points in my own history with my family where I've very much tried to play the role of a fixer um, and have, like, in various situations learned, you know, I nor anyone can actually ever be the fixer. Um, 
hey, it, it, it's just like, you know, oftentimes the things that need to be fixed need to be fixed by the people themselves and you can't really play that role. Um, right. But I, I, yeah, within my family, I have, um, I have certainly taken on that role from time to time. I'm not all the time, but in my friend group, no, I just sort of, <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't necessarily. Play that role. Yeah. Amanda seems like she does with the girl who does the laundry for everyone. And I don't know. I could just sort of, and he just admitted it saying, oh, do I need to pay for this person? But I love, you know, it's funny, Grant, when you were speaking and you you just offhandedly as a mentally healthy person said, well, you can't fix that for people. So, you know, you let them fix it. And and I just wanted to say <laughs> there's this large gray area between you can't fix it and you won't try anymore. <laughs> oh, my God. Grant, oh, yeah. that's so, oh, yeah. Also, but, Amanda, it is yeah. so sweet of you to call me a mentally healthy person. I, I think that you're probably the only person that's called me that. <laughs> I, uh, I, my editorial comments are often like, uh, I get the same comments from my editor and my therapist. Let's put it that way. Like my editor will say, this character needs to slow down and let us know what they're thinking and why. And I have this tendency to have a character find out something really disturbing and then get into a quirky conversation with like a shop owner, you know, or something. And, and what I do both personally and in my fiction is kind of deflect. Like when things get difficult for a character, the character will try to fix someone else. And that's something I've definitely not always been, I've been the one who needed fixing and I've been the fixer. But the, the thing that I continually do both in my work and in my personal life is have a hard time sitting with deep and especially troubling truths. And one way I think I deflect and my characters, especially in the Jet Setters deflect is by being like, wow, I should look at this in myself, but instead I'm going to see that person's problem and try to go right. solve it. So the being the fixer is because you don't want to fix yourself. Is it? I think it's also because some of those other siblings really need yeah. to be fixed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, see, yeah, exactly. That's what all my characters and myself would say. But <laughs> you're you're also dealing with the mother daughter relationships and the worry about them repeating through generations and, you know, worry about worrying about history repeating itself through suicide again, you know, Cord develops the lonely voice, which is sort of like his father's voice. He remembers things that his father said to him, like catch the goddamn ball, you know, because he just wasn't that kind of kid. And I think that's, that's, I don't know, it's so heartbreaking because I know that through my own family. My dad used to call my cousin Damon Martha, and, you know, and he's gay. And later my parents were like, did you know Damon was gay? And I was like, yeah, like when he was five. And <laughs> my uncle said, well, it's because Jimmy used to call him Martha all the time. And, and my mom said, no, because he called Georgia George and she's not gay. But, you know, that that Martha stuff and that catch the goddamn ball, you know, it just and like um, when Lee decides to quit the swim team, her father, who's always doted on her, says, well, you have thighs like your mom anyway. You're too slow. And I, it just tells you so much about how how careful you have to be with your kids because it really sticks with them. And through the book, you see that coming out, the child selves, you know? Well, that's the thing. I was on a panel with Jeffrey Eugenides, um, and he said the most profound thing, I thought, which is that you can tell who everyone is if you think of them at 12. And he was speaking, yes. about, he was speaking about Trump. And he said, yes. imagine, well, that's who he is. And I found that so profound and interesting and i and i think about that a lot with my characters like who are they at 12 do you have to still be the person you were at 12 are you reacting like the person you were at 12 how do you change your 
to make it better or worse for that 12 year old who's still inside you. Well, you know, it feels like coming, that person Amanda, is inside. To, Amanda, to one of your earlier points, like about, about reverting to our 12 year old selves, like family for as wonderful as family is, like family is also a trap in which we are almost forced to revert to our 12 year old selves, right? We like that there's something like primal about and and almost in a, you know inescapable about the dynamics of family that i find i i that i i'm constantly thinking about that you know when i'm like with my family and i'm the youngest yeah. and so smallest and so i'm like you know if there's like a middle seat i'm in it you know what i mean like and i'm a 38 year old man and it's like it's like i but like i you know i'm constantly uh, reverting back to these 12 year old selves well and here's the yeah. question too what happens to a family when circumstances change who's who like one is one was always the smart one but the other one gets into harvard or one was always the tragic one but they have a great success you know it happens in friend groups and also in families when you've been in these roles for so long but then circumstances change and that's something as my sisters and i grow up that is always happening you know one of us will have something happen that sort of changes but wait a minute you're the you're the smart one or you're the one who never gets this or that or you're the one with a good marriage or you know so yeah and that it's strange how disconcerting it is to me when my sisters have any events happen like oh one of my sisters is very successful i should be or it somehow reflects on me and makes me feel weird the same as if you have friends who get divorced or have a tragic or great success you know, if you have a friend it just sort of those are where novels are born in those spaces, you know, where you're figuring out what does it mean for me? <laughs> yeah. Well, my a lot of people a lot of people are stuck in that that idea their parents gave them, you know, about themselves. Mm -hmm. One of my sisters well, one sister says, Oh, I'm the pretty one. And she really is the pretty one. But then another one of my sisters says, Oh, what do I know? I'm the stupid one. And she's she's older you know and i just wonder i always say why do you still accept that because you know both of our parents are dead now they can't do anything to you and you're not stupid it's weird that a, power, a parent can have so much power over a kid you know yeah. things that happen to you in childhood are major yeah um I also i wanted to ask you about i asked you this question um, about a quote that I think about a lot and it's it's from a poem by Louise Glick called Nostros and it means homecoming mm -hmm. and she says we look at the world once in childhood the rest is memory how do you think this relates to your characters and how does it relate to you and your own lives oh my god I like if that that quote, I love her, I love her work. And like that quote is like every single one of my characters in particularly in People We Hate at the Wedding. I'm, I'm probably yes. subsequent as well. But again, just sort of the, about the mutability of memory and how, uh, you know, every, you know, four people could be in the room when something happens and 10 years later, there are four entirely different, often competing stories about what happened in that room that are guided by, their own egos, their own insecurities, their own motivating wants, desires, fears, etc. Um, their own deflections, right? Um, and uh, and yeah, I mean, I think that all that plays into kind of what we've been talking about, twelve-year-old self, right? You you remember yeah. something at twelve, and memory has from you know from when you were a child, and memory has a really fascinating way of kind of you know putting it through a kaleidoscope and then solidifying it in some way that it becomes a story that you tell yourself over and over and over and over and over again. And then that story kind of guides who you are and the way you live your life. Um, right. And so that I think is, is fascinating to me. Um, and also, I mean, it, it plays a role, obviously people we hate at the wedding and it plays a role in the book, certainly the book that I'm currently working on, um, the you know competing memories of um, of certain events. I'm glad to you, Amanda. I don't really get that quote, to be honest. Well, I don't understand. It, I mean, it means, 
present day memory. It's saying that all of your present day um, events are are tainted or colored by your childhood. I Is think so. I I read an article by Elizabeth Strout who read it, and she she took it as kind of your child. It, your child self is your one true self. And then as you age, the edges kind of fall off and you're seeing all these advertisements about happy people smiling, smiling, and you know, everything's peachy, but that's not really, you know, the kind of truth you experienced in your childhood. And then you start becoming lonely and depressed because you think you're not like everyone else. And I love and, that. And Grant, in Grant's book, it really it it really explained it, saying when one of the sisters says, you know, we're never going to be a family like the Warners, and he says, "Fuck the Warners," you know, she's basing it just on their Christmas cards, and he's saying, you know, who cares if we're not like them, you know? But I also I think you carry your child self with you. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say that during a blizzard here, um, we were in a hotel during that crazy Austin, Texas snowpocalypse, and I happened to have just picked up three Elizabeth Strout books from the library, and so I read them in a row. And that really is what she writes about, which is, you know, the inescapability of childhood. And it's constantly people mm -hmm. coming back to people like Lucy Barton, who grows up to be a famous writer, but she's still that child trapped in that mm -hmm. house her brother and and the engine for that book for the second Lucy Barton book is what happened to Lucy Barton's family you never get the scenes you just get the broken kids and you're just right. desperately as a reader trying to put together what did this to them which I thought was a fascinating thing and also she has these um realizations of faith or lack of faith in almost every story a character gets a moment like that so it was really incredible to read them all in a row because yeah, i yeah. would to kind of copy her <laughs> trapped in a snowy hotel room what are I, a question i have is what are the biggest what what is or what are the best takeaways that you want people to have from these books Mm, I can I'll start. So as I think I said before, I, I've written some books that, that end on darker notes. And I really, even before the pandemic, when I started writing The Jet Setters, I wanted to write a book about joy. I wanted to write a book about the possibility of surviving childhood trauma and finding joy. And I hope that's the book I wrote. And I'd like to keep writing that book. <laughs> I feel like... You know, I've written eight books about how hard the hard stuff is, and that's a that's a um, hopeful belief that I'm really clinging to now, coming out of the pandemic, for at least a little while. Like I'm ready for the good times. Yeah, yeah, I love that joy, yeah. right? Surviving yeah. trauma. I think that for for Paul, towards the end of the book, and people we hate at the wedding, is it tells his sister that. <laughs> that love will inevitably disappoint us in some way, shape, or form, but that that doesn't absolve us from the duty of loving. And I think that just that that core message, I think, if, if, if you know, our families may disappoint, and our, our disappoint us, our lovers may disappoint us, our friends may disappoint us. We may disappoint ourselves, um, but that doesn't that doesn't absolve us from the duty of of loving ourselves and loving other people, uh, as hard as it might be sometimes. Um, and so, I think that for, for, particularly for people we hit at the wedding, um, if there's one thing that I want someone to be thinking about when they put the book down, it would be that. I think that's good. That's what that was one of the biggest things I took away from it in both books how like the truth can set you three, free and being who you are can build you up and that moral support from the people who love you can just bring you out of everything. So it was really inspiring. Okay, I still have a couple more questions. Um, let, oh, this is sort of a selfish question. What was your, 
what were your experiences when you first landed an agent? Like, was it a long process or instant, or do you have the same agent still? I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. I, I do have the same agent still. Um, I work with, um, his name is Richard Pine and he's um, at Inkwell Management and he's wonderful. He's kind of like my, my surrogate father in New York because uh, my parents are out West. And I, I, I went, when I wrote my first book, I'm, which, which came out when I was in my twenties and I hope is now just being used to like light fire somewhere. I hope no one ever reads it. Um, it, I, um, it, I, I didn't know really what I was doing. Um, I didn't study fiction in college. I studied political science and I worked as a speech writer in DC and, and kind of in my down times, I would, I started working on a novel set in DC. Um, and I, I really didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I Googled how many words in a novel and then I learned that it was roughly, you know, maybe 80,000 seems like a good number. And so I was like, well, I guess I'll just write 80,000 words. And so I wrote these 80,000 words. And then I, when I was done, I, um, I Googled, I had also just gone through like a terrible breakup and like my heart was broken. It was the first time I had like really had my heart broken. And so I didn't want to do anything. <laughs> Um, and so I just like kind of like, you know, like hold myself up in the sad apartment in Washington, D.C. wrote. Um, and then I Googled how to get an agent. I, I, first, I Googled how to publish a book and I realized you had to have an agent. So I Googled how to get an agent. Um, this was like an advertisement for Google. Um, and I came up with a, a list. I did a bunch of research and I came up with a list of like an A list, B list and C list of who I wanted. And because I have zero self-esteem, I started with the B list. Um, and <laughs> I just sent out a bunch of blind queries and agents will either get back to you in five minutes or five months. There's like zero in between. And so um, I then, while I was waiting, I was like, I'm going to try some people on the A-list. And so I, I ended up blind querying Richard Pine, um, who uh, who took on this book and um, called me at work. And I remember I, I like put my office number on the query letter and he um uh, he called me and i put it on speakerphone and he said something like grant Ginder, let's sell that fucking book of yours and i was like oh, you know it was like, nice. office. Um, and i um, <laughs> i i do not recommend anyone getting an agent this way like cold, like just like writing blind query letters and sending them off into the ether is it's like a you know um, i didn't know anyone and so that's kind of what i had to do um but but I've been with Richard now for, we were talking about it the other day, it's been something like like 13 years. Um, and and he's been great. He, he came to my wedding. He's, he's the best. <laughs> and so, uh, and I, so I feel very, very fortunate that he, um, that he read my query letter and kind of took a chance and. Um, yeah. yeah. I have a similar, my agent was at Carlisle and Company, which is oh, now. Yeah. A, um, no. I met Michael Carlisle at um, a writing conference, and he was support. I think his dad responded to one of mine. I'm older than you, but Michelle Tesla is my agent. I went to New York, and two agents wanted my first novel, and one said it needed a lot of work, and Michelle said it was done. So I went with Michelle, and she was just here in Austin, and we went out to dinner with our kids because to celebrate the paperback of the Jet Setters and the fact that we've been working together for 20 years. Wow. And wow. I text her or email her multiple times a day. And our first New York Times bestseller. Yay! Yeah. 20 New years. York Times bestseller and Reese Book Club, too. Oh, boy, do Does I Reese love Witherspoon just call you and say, Amanda, hi, it's Reese. You're in. And then your book sales go way up because of her <laughs> gazillion followers. <laughs> She did not call me. My editor called me. But yes, the day she announced it, my book was the number one thing on Amazon. Like, the thing. Crushes and, you know, it was, this is my ninth book. So it was, apparently when they announced it at Random House, one of the sales guys was like, I've been selling Amanda for 20 years and it's finally her. So it was good. It was good. Congratulations. Her and uh, and been on Zooms with her, and she, I have the same coffee cup that she has, and it's from Target. <laughs> and she really is like a genuine reader. She is a reader, and it's really yeah, she and is. It's, it's incredible. I went to the offices pre-pandemic. It was great. Yeah, it's been 
a dream. As we all know, it's like one of the three or four dreams. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what was your, this is a weird question, but what is your best day ever? We have to do it quickly because we're almost out of time. But I mean, that could have been yours, Amanda. <laughs> For me, it was selling my first novel, Sleep Toward Heaven, and I took the entire $3,000 advance and bought a barbecue smoker and had a big party yeah. and invited Clay Smith. And two, all my friends loved him, and uh, we've been friends since that day. But that, that celebration, um, and for that $3,000, I sold all the foreign rights and film rights, and then Sandra Bullock optioned it, and I got a box of toffee because I had already sold the rights for that. Three thousand dollars. But it was the best day. That was it. You know, like I, it was my thirtieth birthday too. Oh, the day wow. I got. And my That's agent said, "Take the deal. It's a terrible deal." And I said, "This is the best day of my life, and I'm taking it." <laughs> okay. Well, we're gonna have to sign off. But we can't hear yours, Grant. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. This is the best day of my life. Yeah, I Yay, I feel better for like messing up. Remember, I was like, I hope I don't mess this up. And then I zoomed in from down the street. Um, but I really appreciate you coming. And thank you if anyone out there is still watching after our little snafu. And please buy these authors' books because they're really good, entertaining books by really smart people. Go to the Nowhere Bookshop. It's our bookseller. You just press the buy the book button. So buy away. These you'll love these books. And these are really nice, intelligent human beings. I'm so glad I got to, to meet you. Thank you, Georgia. This was really pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I wish we were in person. I know. I know, me too. <laughs> kind of weird to have a, a, a virtual book book thing with Sponsored by the Nowhere Bookshop, you know? It's, I, I, it's, it's, it's very it's, appropriate. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for anyone else who stuck around for us. Yeah, with my new puppy. Bye. Bye. What's its name? Goodbye, Georgia. All right. Did I just leave? Her name is Rue. It's a family name, R O U X, from my sister. Bye. Bye. Signing Bye. off. Bye. We'll play with the puppy. <laughs> Bye.